Hello and welcome to episode 26 of the Indie Film Academy podcast. Today we're talking with screenwriter Corey Mandel. So, Como se llama? No, Kelly Clarkson! <laughs> welcome to the Indie Film Academy podcast, where it's all about learning how to make and market your independent film online. And now your host, Jason Buff. Hello and welcome to the Indie Film Academy podcast. I'm your host, Jason Buff. Thanks for joining us here today. My guest is Corey Mandel. Corey is an award-winning playwright and screenwriter who has written projects for Ridley Scott, Wolfgang Peterson, Harrison Ford, Warner Brothers, Universal, 20th Century Fox. You name it, he's written it for you. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to talk about uh, to talk with Corey today because he is writing at the studio level, and we really, even though this is indie film, it's really important to know what it's like writing at that level and how things work. Uh, you know, things like getting an agent, the importance of having a manager, things like that. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really talking about something that I didn't know a whole lot about, even though, you know, I'm, as many of you, I'm, I'm also a screenwriter, aspiring screenwriter. So it's, it's good to know, even though my aspirations are more towards indie film. Um, anyway, I learned a lot from, from Corey and, uh, I think he's actually a really, good teacher as well. He teaches a workshop. If you go to CoreyMandel.net, and that's Mandel with two L's, um, he's got a workshop there. And I, I highly, you know, I think he's got some, some great things to teach. I think you should definitely check out his classes. Um, and he's had a lot of success stories. So um, check that out. Uh, I also want to talk for a second about the Indie Film Academy Virtual Summit that's coming up on November 17th. Um, if you are a screenwriter who is, you know, if you're about to make a film or if you're in the middle of making a film or even if you're about to finish or have finished, uh, one of the things that's really important for you to understand is how to sell your film, how to get the film out there, how to make money from it, how to make sure you're not going to rip, get ripped off by distribution companies, how to make sure that you do everything kind of the right way. And this uh, virtual summit is completely free. It's com it's all about how to make sure that you take the right steps after you make your film to you know get it on the right platforms to go to the right film festivals um, the tricks you can do to get it on Rotten Tomatoes and get it reviewed and get it in newspapers and make sure that you're building up your social media and you know that by the time the film comes out you're going to already have an audience you're already going to have people who want to see it um, so. Topics like that, you know, and we have speakers such as John Reese and Jason Brubaker, um, Jerome Kershawn, Linda Nelson, uh, Scott McMahon, um, and Scott Kirkpatrick, and we have a number of other people that are going to be coming on, um, and really just talking about what people need to do to make sure that not only are they, you know, making the right deals and not getting ripped off and making sure that they're going to actually make some money off of their films because you'd be amazed at how many people make feature films. They, they sweat and they, you know, do everything they can. They make a feature film and they end up with almost nothing, you know, because they make bad deals at the end of the day. So we're going to talk about making distribution deals with distribution companies. And we're also going to talk about self distribution in ways that you don't even have to go through that and, you know, make money on your own. Um, we'll also talk about ways to promote your film and, you know, to use social media and to, you know, you know, all that stuff. So check it out. Um, it starts November 17th. What happens is if you don't know anything about virtual summits, basically what it is, is we'll have the presentations on a website and we'll have the first day we'll, we'll have like three or four different presentations. Those are basically going to be videos and you can watch each of the videos from the, um, from the, the people who are given the presentation, and I'll give you the link for that. Now, at the end of the 24 hours, that link won't, won't work anymore, so you have to make sure that you go and watch it on the day that it comes out. So the first one will be on, on November 17th, and the second one will be on the 18th, and you'll get a separate link the next day for all of those presentations. And then after that, they all go away. Okay, So you have to absolutely make sure that you watch those presentations on the days that they come out. And then if you want lifetime access to everything that we do at the summit, um, there's going to be like a package you can buy. I'm not sure what, what that's going to involve yet. We've still got two months before it starts. So, um, But go to IndieFilmAcademy.com 
and there's a little sign up form there. So if you want to participate and you want to, you know, um, get free access to all of those presentations, just check that out. Um, put in your email and I'll mail you when we start. All right. Enough of my, uh, self promotion. <laughs> Here we go. Here's my interview with Corey Mandel. Well, I guess the first thing we should start out with for people who are not familiar with you and your your site and your work, um, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a little bit of background in your career as a screenwriter. Sure. So I went to UCLA Film School, and uh, this was back in the late 90s, and um, was really fortunate to launch my career by having Ridley Scott hire me to write Metropolis. I was still in film school. Uh, it was just amazing to be in a room with Ridley Scott, have him hire me, uh, flew me to London, uh, first time I'd ever flown first class, the first time he knew first class existed, um, <laughs> so I was, you know, <laughs> living on like top ramen noodles on a good day. And, oh, yeah. um, so Ridley committed to making Metropolis and it was the front page of Variety and ultimately didn't get made, which is a whole long story, but, um, but he mentioned me, and he mentioned the script in very positive ways on the front page of Variety. So uh, if you're looking to launch a career, having Ridley Scott say nice things about you and your script on the front page of Variety is not, not a bad way of going. <laughs> right, so, so that's step one. That was, yeah, that was step one, <laughs> my mom say. And um, so then I became, you know, the the super hot writer in town for seven minutes. And, um, and I started... Uh, next project was for Wolfgang Peterson, who had just finished uh, Air Force One, uh, mm-hmm. and I did a project for him. Uh, I did a project for uh, Working Title. I, so I basically ended up doing, over 11 years, uh, I did 19 for Hire Studio Project. And um, you know, for some of your listeners who maybe are a little new to the studio game, basically what that means is... Uh, I would get hired. I'd have an original idea, pitch it to the studios. They'd buy the idea. They hired me to write it. Or what was more often the case, they had a project. They had a writer or a couple of writers. Weren't terribly excited about where it was going, so they would hire me um, to come in and rewrite it. Uh, I, I would also sometimes get hired to uh, adapt novels or graphic novels. And then occasionally I would do production rewrites where you're actually on set when you're making a movie. You don't get credit, but you get a really nice paycheck and you are rewriting structure or comedy or characters on set. So that's basically, for someone who's going to work in a feature film business under assignment, that's kind of a range of the kinds of things you do. Now, what was the process before you... um Got that project with Ridley Scott. I mean, how how did you even get into that world? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, what has happened is um, I had written a script at, uh, when I was at UCLA, and one of my teachers um, was running development for Meg Ryan. And again, this was like 98, and Meg Ryan's a big star. And right. I had written a script. And I uh, somehow convinced the um, her name is Kathy Raven to to take a look at the script, and she read it, and she really responded to it, and she talked to Meg Ryan about it, and Meg really responded to it. Meg wanted to do it, um, so then you get the phone call that everybody wants, which is you know Kathy Raven calls me and says Meg Ryan, you know, very potentially interested in your project. Um, Who is your agent? And of course, I said I don't have an agent. And then she said, would you like me to help you get an agent? And I'm like, uh, let me think about that. <laughs> yeah, I would like that. And, you know, the thing is, the key to getting an agent, and it's easier said than done, is not for you to be chasing the agent, but for the agent to be chasing you. Now, mm-hmm. probably the easiest way to get an agent to chase you is to write something that gets a major piece of talent attached. Um Again, easier said than done. I understand that. Um, so in that situation, I literally have CAA and uh, William Morris and I see him like top agent, um, like clearing their schedule to meet with me. Um, so I did that over the next couple of days and I, um, I chose to go with ICM 
with uh, an agent named Dan Karen, who's awesome. And so, you know, to put it in perspective, Dan Karen at this time, she represents Cali Corey, who won the Academy Award for Thelma and Louise. She represents, mm-hmm. you know, Schwarman, you know, and then little old me. So it's a little intimidating, <laughs> but it was really exciting. And then to make a long story short, um, or somewhat short, uh, right, so Meg Ryan is attached. Now we have directors fighting for the project. We suddenly have studios fighting for the project. Like, this is going to be a big script. So I'm going to make a whole bunch of money, pay off my student loans, get a car, life is good. And then a movie comes out that's in the same genre and somewhat similar, but but really not that similar, but somewhat similar, and it tanks. It tanks at the box office. And suddenly Meg Ryan or someone on her team decides, maybe I don't want to do this. And then suddenly the when Meg Ryan says that, suddenly the directors are like, well, maybe I don't want to do this. And then, of course, suddenly <laughs> the studios are like, well, maybe I don't want to do this. And I remember the House Diane, of Cards. Exactly. Right. And like one thing I'll say for your, your listeners, and I, you know, I'm sure that you have people who have been gone through this, and you also have people who are kind of new to the game and everyone in between. I'll just say that the experience I just went through, I, I constantly get calls from uh, students and writers I work with who go through the same thing. It's like you get as close as you can without it actually happening, and you feel potentially like there's something wrong with you or <laughs> you're cursed. And the thing is, is when you start to talk to lots of writers, you realize it's a pretty typical experience. And so, so at the end of the day, it was not going to sell, which was crushing. But, you know, I had a writing sample, I had an agent, and I think most importantly, I had credibility because the script I wrote had attracted a major star. And so that gives you credibility. So my agent said, do you have any ideas for, you know, a pitch? Um, because now that you have this credibility, let's see if we can't sell a pitch. And I said, yeah, this, this is an idea I've always loved. And so I ran it by her, and she said, yeah, I think that can have traction in the marketplace. And then she pulled out, you know, a pad of paper and a pen. She goes, okay, let's do the fun part. Let's make our dream list. Like, if you could sell this pitch and work with anyone at all, who would it be? And the very first thing I said was Ridley Scott. Um and she said, great, no great choice, who else? And so we made our list of, like, major A-listers, and it was sort of like, okay, that's our dream list. Now let's start making a list of maybe one more practical folks in case the dream list doesn't happen. And, um, but I, I got, we went, you know, she goes, let's start with Rosie Scott, since that was your number one choice. I went there, met with the development executive. Um, they really responded to the pitch. They brought me in to re- producing partner at the time, Mimi. She responded to the pitch, and literally two weeks later, um, and this is a little embarrassing, but I get a call, and I've been up really late, and I'm like half asleep on the phone, ring. I think it's 1030, um, and my agent says, we're leaving town, and he'd like to hear your pitch at 1130. <laughs> and it's like, it takes me 45 minutes to get there, and I have to shower and shave and all that. So I said, oh, that's exciting, but can I go in later today, like at 3? And there's this long pause where I'm sure my agent is thinking, why do I find this person? And then very nicely, <laughs> very nicely, she says, Corey, we're at least in town. He'd like to hear your pitch at 11 o'clock. And I, I went, oh, of course, yes, I will be there. And I don't know how, but <laughs> I, but it really worked to my favor, Jason, because um, I wasn't nervous. Like, I, I, I was, everything just to get there. I'm literally in a room pitching a really before I think I, pro- I could process that that's really Scott because he was a big hero of mine, still is. And, um, of course. Yeah. And he bought it in the room. So in the room, he said, if you don't mind, I'd like to buy this and I'd like to uh, fly you to London and work with you on the structure and have you write wow. it. You know, and it's like, well, Ridley, let me check my schedule. I think I can make <laughs> that work. <laughs> yeah, well, our people can talk and we'll figure it out. And, yeah. yeah sure. So, so let, let me ask you, can I can I just pause on that for one second? And yeah. um, I, I want to make sure we talk about a lot of different things. But one thing that we're talking about right now is the pitch. Yeah. So is there any sort of, uh, I mean, you're in your car, you're driving up, you're going to see, you know, a legend. Yeah. I mean, you have to be nervous. How, what, what does, what do you do to, like, make it all work out? I mean, or what what's your pitch? I mean, how does it work? And you know, in terms of how does one prepare themselves for a pitch or not get nervous? Or, I mean, the actual well, pitch how do was you, a lot. The, yeah, sorry. I mean, what what is, 
what what do you say? I mean, how how do you take your screenplay and put it? I mean, what is it uh, like a five minute, six minute pitch that uh, you do? Or right. so this is not a screenplay. So it, um, generally, okay. you know, when people are pitching, they have it written. So generally, if you have an idea, you got two avenues, right? You can spec it, which is to write the script on spec, and then that's the thing that would be shown to people the actual script, or you can pitch it where you haven't written it yet. You have an idea. You're talking people through the through the idea. And then if they like it and they believe in you as a writer, they'll buy the pitch and then they'll hire you to write it. Um, generally speaking, for those you know, listeners who are kind of new to the game, you don't get invited to pitch these days unless you have credibility. So, And it's even more so than when I was first here. So generally, they're only going to listen to a pitch and buy a pitch from a writer that they are extremely confident can deliver on the actual script. So for newer writers, you're not pitching these days, you're specking. You want to prove not just that you have a great idea, but you can execute on it. Um, so, yeah, so what had happened is I went in there, and it was like a 45-minute pitch, and it was basically giving them the characters and the world and the story and everything that happens and trying to do it in a way that was most engaging as possible. And then he asked me lots of questions, and we had a conversation, and we were really talking through everything. Uh, I was there for a couple of hours, and at the end of it, you know, he had a re- really had a really clear vision of what my vision was and what I was going to go and write. And he said, "Yeah, let's." So then he bought the pitch, so I get a certain amount of money for that. And then also they hire me to write it, so I get money for that. So it's basically like you have an idea for a script. And before you write it, you sort of vet it to make sure there's a market for it. And if someone's interested enough, they'll buy the idea and they hire you to write the script. Um, and that's quite common in TV. And it happens in features, but generally it's only going to happen to a writer who has a certain level of credibility. Okay, and what is the... Now, for, for writers who are trying to understand what the relationship is with you and your agent. Your agent is the one that got you in the room there in the first place, right? Yeah. So agents are your sales force. Agents are going to sell your script um, and or they're going to get you in the right rooms with the right people um, for pitches or for writing assignments. So that was the other thing is let's say that uh, you write a script and it goes out in the marketplace and everybody loves the script. They think you are have a fresh original voice great characters, great structure, but nobody buys the script. It's just, it's not fitting what they're looking to buy, but everyone's like, that's a great script. So at that point, you know, the agent will send you on a round of meetings, um, and those round of meetings could be 20 to 30. And there's kind of three kinds of meetings that are all going to be happening. So one I would call the general relationship where someone's read the script and they are blown away by it, um, they're not looking to hire a writer for a project. They're not really looking to buy a pitch. There, there's no, uh, there's no money that's going to come out of this meeting, but it's a relationship building meeting. They just really love your script and your writing. They want to get to know you. They try to figure out, you know, if you're the kind of person they want to work with. If you're crazy or not, there's a lot of crazy writers out there. <laughs> And they just sort of, what are you interested in? And, and, and let me tell you the kinds of things we're interested in. Because down the road, they truly would like to find a way to work with you. And some writers get disappointed because they'll take that meeting and they realize somewhere during the meeting, I'm not going to get hired. There's no money that's going to come out of this. And those writers are, uh, they don't get it. You know, relationships are really important because, you know, maybe six months later, that person is looking to hire someone. The fact that, that you had a really good meeting with them and they really want to work with you, that could lead to a job. So so you write a script. Everybody loves it. It doesn't sell. You go on a round of meetings. And one type of meeting is this relationship-building meeting. Another meeting could be they really love your script. If you have the right idea, they buy a pitch from you, and they would help you develop it. So that's a meeting where you're going in, and they're like, hey, what ideas do you have in your pitching? Um, that's what that was the kind of meeting it was with Ridley Scott. Another kind of meeting could be they loved your script, couldn't buy it, but we have we we have the right to this graphic novel, or we have the right to this article, or we have an idea that we've been kicking around internally, or we have a script that somebody wrote, 
well, we want a pretty big rewrite and we want to make it darker or we want to make it, we want to make the character this kind of a character or whatever. And you seem like you could be a good person for that. And so then what happens is you're basically being invited to audition. It's like an actor audition. So then if it's a script, you'll read it and you'll come back in and you'll say, this is what I would do. This is how I would change it. This is my vision for it. And they're having other writers do this as well. Um, and then they're going to pick the writer who they, the vision that they like the most. Or if it's an original idea that they have or an article, same thing. You're going to go home. You're going to come back in and you're going to pitch what you would do with this idea or what you would do with this article. And you're generally competing against other writers. So what the agent does is they're, they're going to try to sell your script. Often that means packaging, putting elements, of, you know, to make the, it more exciting. They can go out and there's a script with a star, a script and a director. Um, and concurrent to that, they're going to send you on meetings. And again, these meetings could be relationship building. They could be you pitching original ideas. It could be them looking to hire a writer. And you go through a round of those. And uh, maybe somewhere along the way, you'll launch your career. You'll sell a pitch. They'll get hired to write something. Your script will actually sell. All of that's possible. It's also very possible that at the end of that, none of that happens. You, you met a lot of people. You got a lot of great relationships. But at the end of the day, you didn't get a job out of it. And then what you do is you're going to have to give your agent another really great script. And you're going to go through a second cycle. And you have a better chance of watching your career the second time around than the first time because you have relationships and also you're no longer a one-trick pony. You've now proven that you, you're capable of writing more than just one great script. But it's possible at the second round, you still haven't launched your career. So you have to write another great script and go through a third round. And a lot of agents will say, if you go through three rounds of meetings and you haven't landed your first job, there's a good chance there's something wrong with you. There's a good chance that you're turning people <laughs> off. No, not everybody plays well with others, you know. And if you are seen right. as defensive or arrogant or just someone that people don't want to work with, then, you know, no matter how great your writing is, it's probably not going to happen. But assuming you play well with others, and what I certainly see with my students and clients, you know, by the third round of meeting, they're getting their, their, their shot. Now, what you do with that shot is a whole different story. Okay. Now, you wrote a, a very good screenplay relatively early on in your, I mean, even before your career had kind of even started. What what were the things that, you know, brought you to that level of writing? I mean, were you just born a good screenwriter? Or what, what happened good, at school that really right. you know, made you able to write a good screenplay like that? A great question. And, you know, there's so much misinformation out there because I have a lot of friends or managers and I'm not going to out anyone here, but what happens is there's this myth that if you're a great writer, once you start writing, you write great scripts. And it's just not true. Um, I know so many writers who, I mean, I'm talking Academy Award winning writers. I'm talking writers who, who created big hit TV shows. I'm talking about writers who make millions of dollars who, it seems like everything they write is just amazing. And there was five or six years where they weren't that good. And they were just getting a little bit better and a little bit better. And they were doing the right kind of training and they were being mentored. And then what happens is after five or six years, they finally are writing at a level where they can be taken seriously. They sell a script and they will just say, or their manager will make up some story. Like that was the first thing they wrote. And they just forget about all the development. No, and that's really important for people to hear that because it's a really abusive message otherwise. Because if you don't realize that and you buy into the fairy tales, and it, people are doing it strategically. It, it, it makes you sexier and it makes you more desirable as a writer just to be someone who naturally is a great writer. Like that's what everybody, everybody wants to work with natural talent. So it's in people's interest to pretend they have natural talent, but it's just, I don't know a single successful writer who didn't start out as someone who had a lot of potential but kind of sucked and and was taught and was mentored and got better. And so in my case, um, you know, and as a writer, I wouldn't 
I wouldn't talk about this way, but I'm wearing my teacher hat. So um, <laughs> I'll be com- I'll be completely honest. What happened is I um, I was in film school and uh, I never wrote anything. And a friend and I kind of wrote a script together, and it sold as a USA Cable movie starring Virginia Madsen. And it was a great concept. And if we were just a little bit better writers, it, we probably could have sold it as a feature. Um, but at the time, it was the very first thing I wrote. I co-wrote it with a friend. So I kind of thought I was God's gift to writing because no one else in my film school class sold anything. Okay, it was USA Cable, but it paid pretty good. It was Virginia Mass, and it got made. It was very successful for a cable movie. I mean, for your first time out, at least for me, I was thinking, that's not so shabby. So my uh, friend and I had a big falling out, so our collaboration ended. It's a whole other long story. But So now I'm solo, and uh, I write the script, and uh, I'm in a writing group, and there are, like, professional working writers in this group. They were all very honest with each other, and I showed it to them. They really liked it. They had some notes. They had a few issues, so I did a rewrite. Shows them some notes, rewrite, you know how it goes. But I eventually got the script to a point where they're like, this is great. This will sell. This will launch your career. You know, I'll show it to my agent if you want. This is so, this is one of the best scripts I've ever read. And of course, I'm thinking, who am I to argue with that assessment, right? <laughs> and, uh, so I showed it to a film school professor and he reads it and, you know, same thing. Best thing I ever read. Definitely gonna sell. Uh, I'll, I'll get it to my, you know, help you get an agent, yada, yada, So at the time, I was working for this manager, and uh, almost as a favor, I said, you want to read the script? Like, I was, fa- I was like an intern. I wasn't represented by him. And so he read the script, and we met. And I'll never forget, he said, um, it's, uh, it, it's pretty good for like a, a, a dirty first draft. You don't want to show anyone in the industry the script. You only get one first impression. The script's not that good, but it has potential. And I, this was like a weird disconnect for me because I, it's not what I've been told by everybody else. And what he said is, your professional writers, professors, friends, they're being honest with you, but they don't know how hard it is to break into business. They don't know the bar that you have to hit. And by the way, that's the late 90s. The bar is a lot higher today. And he said, every time you go out the script, it gets coverage. And that coverage gets database. Everyone shares it. So if the script's not, like this script's good, but it's not amazing. And there's a big difference between good and amazing. And in this industry, nobody cares about good. So he basically said, I'll work with you if you're willing to put the work in to help you help make the script what it needs to be and help you become a better writer. And I was really honestly torn at that time because I was thinking maybe his opinion is just not valid compared to everything else. <laughs> and so he suggested something that I suggest to all of my uh, students and clients, which is you really think your script's ready because you only get one first impression. And that's the most cherished asset you have is your first impression. So what he suggested is go hire studio readers, like literally hire people who I, mean, I hired someone from Imagine, someone from like Warner Brothers, like actual working readers, pay them under the table, I think it was like a hundred bucks, and have them do the coverage report they would actually do. The script's not in tracking, it's not, their coverage report goes to you, nobody else, because it's not officially in the system. You're paying them to do the coverage report they would actually do if the script had come through the system. So I didn't have the money to do it, but I did it. And um, when the coverage has come back, one of the things they will do is they'll uh, evaluate the writer, and they'll say, uh, recommend, consider, or pass. And I think they all came back pass on the writer, um, which was a real kick to the gut, but at the same time, I was so appreciative that I knew that. You know, and, and I didn't make the classic mistake of listening to everyone telling me how great it was, find someone who took it off the marketplace, and now suddenly, you know, my name, first script, path, is what everybody that has in their record. So I worked with that manager, and, you know, it was a year and a half. And in that year and a half, like, I learned everything I didn't know. And I learned what my weaknesses were and worked really hard trying to the strengths. And after a year and a half, a brutal work, 
uh, this manager is not a pleasant person, and he did not. He was smart. He didn't know how to work with writers very well. So it was a brutal experience, but I learned a lot. And at the end of it, he's like, I think it's now ready. I'll pay for the coverage. And he bought, he paid for some people to do the coverage. And the coverage all came back, recommend, recommend, recommend. And that was the script that I then showed, you know, Kathy Raven and all this happened. So no, I, as a writer, I would, I would have said the following. Um, I went to film school in the producer's program. It wasn't the screenwriting program. I didn't think I could be a screenwriter. Um, I took a class where they made us write a screenplay. I didn't want to because I was supposed to be a producer. I didn't think I could write. <laughs> I, I took this class. I wrote the script. Uh, the teacher read it. Next thing you know, Meg Ryan's attached. Next thing you know, <laughs> and, and by the way, though, right. all, all of that is true. It's all uh-huh. true. I just, I just took out that year and a half. Uh, right. uh, writer boot camp part. <laughs> well, okay, can you can you explain kind of what happened between the version that you thought was good that your manager didn't think was very good and the one that he finally thought was good? I mean, what what changed? It was just learning a lot about story structure and character development and conflict and just all the things that... I work with writers now and I coach them through this process and the thing is there's such a big gap between good and amazing. And there are a lot of writers who, you know, they'll read some books, they'll read some scripts, they'll watch a lot of movies and TV shows. They have a bunch of natural abilities. They work hard. They have friends. They're in a writing group. And they can get themselves up to good or maybe really good, but they can't get themselves up to amazing. And and it's different for each person, but, you know, everybody has inherent strength as a writer. Everybody has inherent weaknesses. And everybody has blind spots. And blind spots are weaknesses that you don't know that you have. So when I'm working with someone, the first thing is to help them understand what their blind spots are. So at least now they're known weaknesses as opposed to unknown. But then really the important thing is helping people get uh, dedicated exercises and dedicated practice so that they can turn weaknesses into strength. And it absolutely can be done. It takes time, it takes training, and the key is to work with someone who can help coach you through that. Because the thing that's sad for a lot of people is a lot of the books and classes, they're teaching rules, and they're teaching paradigms, and formulas, and A, the, the industry is moving so far away from that that you know most agents and managers won't even look at you if that's what you're doing. Um, because that's not something they can work with anymore. But also, B, you learn a bunch of rules and a paradigm, you feel educated, but you haven't become a better writer. Uh, It's not that inside-out process approach, which is what are my strengths, what are my weaknesses, what are my blind spots, and then how do I turn weaknesses into strength? Um, that's, That's the road to transformation. And the thing is, managers, especially good managers, that's what, that's what they will do. Um, they'll, you know, they have their client base that are making money. They have their uh, the B team. You know, they'll, they'll take some people they think have potential, and they'll develop those writers in exactly the way I'm talking about. Um, or you can get mentored by, you know, a successful writer who can help coach you through that process. Unfortunately, a lot of the classes and the books do the opposite. Um, and that probably sounds really self-serving because, you know, at some point I'll do a commercial for my workshops and, and for <laughs> my workshops. And I get that. And, you know, and, and so if you want to take all this with, with a cynical green of salt, I understand. But um, the thing is, what I endeavor to do in my workshops is to help people have to get the kind of training that they would get if they had a manager or a mentor. And, and obviously, and I tell everyone this, um, if you have a choice between my workshop and an actual manager or a writer who can mentor you, obviously go with the manager or the writer because, like, that's better than the workshop. The workshop is there for people who aren't able to get that at this point. And so I get a lot of MFA students who have a lot of education in the realm of rules and paradigms, and they're writing – they're not overcoming core weaknesses, so they keep writing scripts that are similarly flawed, and – they're writing formulaic, predictable, generic kinds of scripts, which is exactly the, the wrong kind of script to work on. 
Okay. Now, um, so I assume things like save the CAD and all those things are kind of like, you know, you would consider that really going in the wrong direction, that, that people aren't looking for that sort of thing anymore. Yeah, so, and again, the thing is, it's not what I say, but agents and managers say, right? Because otherwise it's like I'm somebody that's saying, oh, don't listen to that teacher or writer. Come listen to me and spend your money with me, you know, right? <laughs> right. So it's like, okay, it doesn't matter what I say, but I say. It matters what agents and managers say. And so the reality is agents and managers in this marketplace, in feature and in TV, are looking for pitch-perfect authentic scripts. And they're looking for scripts that are authentic, which means authentic characters, but an authentic voice. It's a script we haven't seen before. It's a story we haven't seen before that is pitch-perfect execution. Very difficult to achieve this as a writer, but putting that aside, these scripts go viral, which means when someone writes a script like this and shows it to someone in the industry, they talk about it and they 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 it's all the friends and the script gets passed around and there's a buzz and that's what's required to break the writer out of all of the white noise that everybody's trying to break in the business. So if I'm an agent and I sign you and now I'm getting on the phone, but I, I by the way I don't know you might have sold a bunch of stuff I might a lot of, might have a lot of credibility. But let's just say you're a newer writer. Nobody really knows who you are, and you don't really have any credibility. Again, I'm, I'm not saying that's true for you, but let's just say that's true. So if I'm an agent, I'm now calling everybody saying, you got to read Jason's script, and I'm basically putting my credibility on the line. I'm chasing people to read your script, and they'll eventually do it, but they're busy, and they'll get to it eventually. As opposed to, if you write a script that everyone's buzzing about, everybody's talking about, but oh, you read, that's, it's like what used to be the blacklist, those blacklist scripts. Everybody's talking about the scripts. Everybody's buzzing about those scripts. Now people are calling me, the agent, saying, how come I'm not meeting with, you know, Jason? I want to meet with Jason. That's a whole different game. And more importantly than that is, so let's look at it this way. If you're an agent, let's say you have your, uh, your basic, like me, your sort of basic client. And so here's, here's how the Corey Mandel game worked. There would be a writing assignment you would call and say, I think Corey is perfect for this and here's why. And they probably have heard of me. Um, I've got a track record. Um, they say, sure, we'll put Corey's name on the list. So I now get to compete for that job. Other agents are doing the same thing. A bunch of writers are competing for that job. Um, I don't get it. So now you're calling somewhere else and you're getting me to compete for another job. You're, you're putting energy in. Eventually, I book a job, and you get 10% of my money. And I I made really good money, so you're making 10% of really good money. Okay, that's not too terrible as an agent. But, you know, my agent also represents Aaron Sorkin. So first of all, when Aaron Sorkin makes a tremendous amount more money than I do, number one. So right away, much more valuable client. But number two, how do you get Aaron Sorkin a job? You answer the phone when it rings. Everybody's chasing <laughs> him, right? He's right. an A-list writer. So a basic working writer is always chasing job. An A-list writer, everyone's chasing him. So someone calls my agent and they go, we've got this novel. We think Aaron would be perfect for it. You know, like, I don't know exactly what my agent says, but he probably says, this is Aaron's quote. <laughs> it's probably really high. And you agree to it, and then I'll give Aaron the book to see if Aaron might be interested. I mean, you would rather have one Aaron Sorkin than 20 Corey Mandel. And so as an agent, you're looking for people who have the potential to be A-list writers um, in both TV and feature, because that's where all the money is. And someone who follows Save the Cat or other such sort of paradigm formulas, these scripts do not become A-list writers. Uh, So when you look at scripts, that have launched A-list careers like Juno, like, uh, you know, American Beauty, uh, like Mad Men. Um, we can go on and on and on. They're not following the paradigm. They're authentic scripts. They're original. And so if I'm an agent and somebody has written to one of these formulas 
that a lot of the summer movies are going to follow. And by the way, just between you and me, I I wrote a lot of summer movies, and I often would follow formulas because if you're working for Warner Brothers and they're doing X Men Five, they're not looking for American Beauty; they're looking for someone who can sort of execute on that hero's journey uh, paradigm. Um, the thing is, let's say you're an original writer, a new a new writer, and you write one of those scripts. It's not as easy as it looks to really make it interesting. It's not as easy as it looks to follow. It's sort of like Ikea. It's not as easy as it looks to follow the formula. So let's say you can do it. Let's say you can do it. And so people read your script, a brand new writer, and like, hey, this guy can smartly follow a formula. Who cares? Really, who gives us that you-know-what? Because there's a lot of writers that can do that. And some of those writers are like Corey Mandel, who has worked for really big people, and like Ridley Scott, and Wolfgang Pearson, they've always wanted to work with me again. So, like, that's, that gives me a lot of credibility. I have a track record where I've worked under deadline. I've been in situations where three weeks before I'm turning a script in, the studio calls me, and they want a completely different direction, and I can pull that off. I've proven that I could pull that off. So I have a huge advantage over you. And then, of course, the person who wrote Guardians of the Galaxy has an enormous advantage over me, you know, because they've written something – stuff that's made a tremendous amount of money. My point mm-hmm. being, there's people who can follow, there's a lot of people who can follow a paradigm. They have a track record, you don't. So why does anybody care? Nobody cares. That's what agents are, are constantly sending me people to my classes. It's like, I can't break somebody into the business because they followed a conventional paradigm because nobody will read that. Like, nobody cares. Um, <laughs> as opposed to, you write a script that nobody's seen before. It's really fresh and exciting, and it gets people's attention. It's what's called a head-turning script. Now, I worked with someone who spent, you know, a year and a half to to write that script, wrote that script, didn't sell, and they got offered, like, oh, I think it was, like, 300 grand to write Panda Bear 3 or Panda Bear 4, and he, like, calls me, he's like, I don't know if I should do it or not, because I worked so hard to be able to write to this level. Now they're offering me a lot of money, to do a formulaic, you know, paint by the number script. And what do I do? And my answer was, my job is to help you to get to the point where you have that decision. You make the mm-hmm. decision. Like, it could, you know, I think it'll go either way. Personally, me, I just always took the job. I always took the money. I don't think that was smart, but that's what I did. But my point is, uh, the disconnect that a lot of people make is, uh, there's these people that are like code breakers. They go, look at all these movies coming out in the summer. I've decoded what happens on every page, and then they teach this paradigm. And then writers go, well, I should write a script that, you know, is commercial if I want to break into business. This is what the studios are making in the summer. Um, I should write a script like that. And it's the exact opposite that's true. Agents will tell you, most of the clients I, I sign, I signed off of scripts that I – was really confident I couldn't sell because they were different. They were original. Like, Eric Singer wrote the script, The Sky is Falling. It's so violent, so dark, that nobody was going to buy the script. Like, nobody. But everybody had to meet this guy. Everyone had to meet the guy who wrote this. And people wanted to find a way to work with it. And so he was booking assignments and making what I I think is nice six-figure income year in and year out and kept writing original material and eventually... One of those, uh, one thing he wrote, uh, got made is American Hustle. And now he's, you know, a big A-list writer, probably making, you know, millions of dollars. But for many, many years, he was a working writer making six-figure income off of a script that didn't follow the paradigm, didn't follow the form. It was just so original and so dark and so messed up in a good way that everybody passed that script around. Everybody said, have you read this guy's song? You've got to read this guy. That's what agents and managers, you know, that's what they want. They want something different and original. And um, even if that is a sample that you use to start writing straight down the middle, save the cat somewhere scripts, fine. But you can't, it's really difficult to break into business writing a script like that because it's a dime a dozen and just nobody cares. Can you talk a little bit about, for example, 
when you're looking at, for people who are trying to break in as screenwriters, mm-hmm. you know, what are the essential things that they need to do if they're I'm assuming what you're saying is people need to submit just amazing samples. I mean, uh, let's say you don't have a, a vehicle where somebody like Meg Ryan wants your screenplay and, sure. and you're you're just going the direct way and saying, I want to find an agent to. Right you know, to, to support me, what is the, what kind of spec screenplay do you think they, that right. would kind of like work for them? Well, so what, what works for people again is pitch perfect authentic and authentic would be, you know, a script that only you could have written that's completely original. So, you know, um, you know, David Tyler wasn't sitting around going, I wonder what will sell in the marketplace. I've got a script about, you know, a guy with a stuttering problem. Um, that the King's Speech was just something that he was really impassioned to write. Um, he had, you know, he's publicly discussed that he'd had a stuttering issue, and there was it's just a very personally uh, important script to him. Um, and he wrote that script, and uh, you know, he wasn't trying to game the marketplace. He was just writing a script with an amazing character, amazing story that was he was really impassioned about. And you read that script. It doesn't read like any other script. It's like you read American Beauty, you don't say, oh, another one of these scripts. There's just something original about it and different. And it doesn't have to be a quirky character piece. Again, the sky is falling, you know, it's about the end of the world, and these priests are just going around killing people. And it's very dark, and it's very violent. Um, It's certainly not Juno from a tonal point of view. But there's just something... You hadn't seen that before, and it was something unique and powerful. And so you look at a, a spec script like uh, Groundhog Day. You know, it is a classic rom-com, but it just doesn't – you don't read that spec script and say, oh, I, you know, if I have to read another rom-com script, I'm going to kill myself. It's, it's different. There's just something different and original and uh, exciting and fresh about it. That's the kind of script. And the thing is um, – when I go and speak at events, you know, I always hear writers complain, oh, it's so hard to get an agent, it's so hard to get a manager, no one wants to read my work, no one wants to represent me, they only want to, you know, represent known commodities. Thing is, is that's just not true. Um, I, the last couple of days I've been meeting with managers and they all have the same complaint. We can't find enough new, really great writers. You know, and they're all like, who are your students should I read? Um, they're, they're, they cannot find enough new, there's so many opportunities for writers now, particularly in TV, um, but more and more in features. The thing is, it's not looking, it's not looking for new writers, that's, that's pretty easy, and it's not looking for new writers who think they're really great, because that's just a lot of those people. It's new writers who really are amazing. I mean, if you look at, the script for Juno, you look at the script for American Beauty, you look at um, the script uh, for uh, Mad Men. You there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, my phone did a weird thing. I wasn't sure. Um, <laughs> right. I mean, these, these are, these are uh, amazing scripts. So, um, like, I know the guys that wrote, uh, they wrote the spec script for The Nick, the TV show. I mean, that script was really great. And Steven Soddenberg, who had retired, you know, he, he, he got that script and read it and that lured him back. Um, people still talk about the Game of Thrones pilot script. Uh, it, it's just an amazing piece of writing. Um, the Americans, I remember when that pilot went around town and everybody was about, everybody was talking about that script. And the thing is, there's a lot of skill and ability that goes into writing at that level, at the highest level. And if a new writer can write to that level, managers are looking for them. The, the, the scarcity here, and I'm sorry, to, I used to be an economist, so sometimes I slip into old patterns. The scarcity is not on a huge <laughs> manager. But, so, no, this is really important because – okay. If there, if the scarcity was on that front, which is what everybody thinks, which means you've got all of these new writers who can write amazing scripts and there's just not enough agents and managers to go around, if that was the case and you were one of those writers, how do you persevere? Well, luck, 
uh, connections, relationships. That's what, those, that's what's Thanks for that's listening to the careful. Indie Film Academy Careful. podcast. Don't forget to join our newsletter for more this tips and tricks more. on how to make and market your film online. Go to www.indiefilmacademy.com. So that means if you're a new amazing talent as a writer, and I'm not saying you can just sit at home and they'll come find you, but I'm just saying getting a manager is actually easy because they're looking for you. Um, HBO has executives who are out going to one act plays, uh, looking, um, through YouTube. They're, they're looking for fresh, original, new voices. Um, the thing is, there's obviously a lot of people out there that want to be writers. They have an original, unique voice and take, have passion about this, have read books. Uh, there's a lot of those people. The percentage of those people who can write pitch perfect, who can write to the level that people are looking for, you know, is one mm-hmm. hundredth of one percent at best. And so the key is I think a lot of writers get taken advantage of because there are businesses out there that basically say what stands between you and a career is access. And don't worry, I can help solve that for you. You know, I'm going to have this pitch fest, or I'm going to shop your script, or I'm going to list your script, or I'm whatever it is. I'm going to help you get access if you're willing to give me some money. So, you know, there was a pitch fest that I used to go and teach at, and I'm not doing it anymore. I just don't feel good about doing it because there's, you know, five, six hundred people coming to L.A. paying hundreds and thousands, not hundreds of thousands, hundreds or thousands of dollars, and they get the pitch in front of people. Uh, they get five minutes to pitch in front of someone. Well, no one's going to buy their pitch. But what they might do is, like your pitch, like your energy, like you, geez, can you write at all? They won't be that blunt about it, but they'll say, give me a writing sample. And then if that writing sample is amazing or close to amazing, then they'll bring you in for a meeting and really start to see if something can be there. And I was just talking to all these executives, and a lot of them were like, yeah, we're just not going to do this anymore because we've gone through three or four years' worth of these. We've asked for a couple hundred writing samples, and so far, not one writing sample was anywhere near good enough for us to bring that person in. So it's just a complete waste of time for everybody involved. So now, obviously, if a listener, if they are in a position, they're in that point oh one and one percent. They're a new writer. They don't have a track record. They don't have an agent or manager, and they are writing pitch perfect authentic. They're able to do this. Sure, if, if there's someone can help them get some access, why not? But the reality is, for most people, they're spending so much time and energy and maybe money trying to solve the access part of this as opposed to spending time and energy figuring out where they are as a writer and what they need to do to get to become a better writer. So it's sort of like people are spending all this money to get interviews for a surgeon's job because they really want to be a surgeon because it's good money and it's good benefits. They've never been to medical school. So, yeah, you can spend all this money and get an interview at a hospital, but they're never going to hire you you know, as opposed to spend your time and energy actually getting medical training so that you're qualified for the job. There's so many people out there who just aren't qualified, and they're not doing the training to get there. Now, do you think that getting a manager is an important step to, like, I mean, should you try and do that before you try to go find an agent and, you know, kind yes, of really yes, get yes, them yes. to get you in shape? Okay. Yes, 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 yes. For, for all bunch of reasons. Agents especially these days, they are salespeople. people. They are not there to help you your career. They're not there to develop you. They're not there to take your script and say, it's, it's close, but it needs to get better. Uh, they're just a sales force. And the manager is someone that is going to help develop you, um, help understand your career. So first thing, yeah, I would definitely go for a manager before you get an agent. First of all, a manager will let you know when you're ready for an agent and they'll protect you and not and keep you from agents until you're ready. They'll help develop you if they're a good manager. Careful, a lot of bad managers out there, but assuming it's a good manager. And then 
when it gets to the point where you're ready for an agent, they'll know who's a good agent for you. Because the thing is, is all agents have a superpower of being able to sit in a room and somehow know what it is you want to hear and tell you what you want to hear, even if it's not true. So uh, a manager is going to know you, your personality, your writing, and they're going to be in a place to help figure out what would be a good agent for you. Also, is there any way to make yeah. sure that you're finding, a, the, I mean, a good agent? I mean, where where is that kind of – where do you find them? <laughs> well, the, so the thing is, is you don't. You, okay. you don't find an agent because – I mean, sorry, I was talking about a, a manager. Where, how do you like? How do you go about finding a manager? Right. So it's actually not that hard. So um, you know, one thing you want to be careful about is I'm starting to see more and more of these management companies that are just taking advantage of people. So like, you don't want to find a manager that's charging you. You don't want a manager that's taking 10% of anything. You know. Uh, it's like one management company is actually like taking, if you're an editor or uh, a web designer, they're going to take 10% of your income. It's like, so there's, there's these scams out there. you got to be careful of that. But that aside, what you're looking for, um, it's not hard to network. It's not hard to find out like who the good management companies are. And so, you know, the management companies, if you reach out to them and you just reach out to like the lowest person, like the, the intern, the or the creative executive who's reading scripts, like the lowest person on the food chain. And you have a nice little thirty seconds, one minute little presentation. You call enough of them, there's a good chance you'll find one or two of them to take a look at your script, which really means we'll just take a look at the first couple pages to see if you know how to write. And if your script's amazing, you know, there's a really good chance that that you'll hear back from them. Um, the thing is, is I know a lot of those people, a lot of those people are my students, and they'll tell you 99% of the time, you know, it, it, what they're amazed at is how bad the scripts are. You know, it, it's not amazing. <laughs> it's not amazing that there's writers out there that think they're where they are. There's writers that think the script is really great and it's not. What they find amazing is, like, how wide that gap could be. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's not... It's not hard at this point to get people in management companies, um, especially like the lowest level person, to take a look. And if you live in LA, like these folks who like these, these newer people in the management companies, they're networking. They're always going to network events, they're going to writers' guild events, they're at screens, they're at certain parties. It's not hard to get plugged into that circle if you live in LA. And if you don't live in LA, that's okay. You don't have to move to LA. Um, you know. With the internet, it's not hard to, to find out who these people are and reach out to people via Twitter and Facebook and email. And it's just, it's, it's not that hard to get people to read scripts. I'm not saying it's easy, but what I'd say is be, training yourself to be able to write the kind of script that when somebody reads it, it has a positive outcome for you. That is so much harder than getting someone to read a script. And the mistake, the biggest mistake that writers make is they, you go out to a management company, you get someone to read your script, it's just not that good. It's probably it. Like, they're probably not going to read a script from you. And they database this stuff, so suddenly maybe, you have to just burn your bridge there, you might have burned your bridge elsewhere. Um, your first impression is precious. And you're like a minor leaguer, and when you get pulled up to the majors, you have to hit a home run your first time. Now, that's not how it works in baseball, right? If you're a minor leaguer, you show a lot of potential. You come <laughs> up to the majors, you strike out the first time. They probably don't send you back. They probably give the batting coach that work with you. You strike out enough times, they're going to send you back. It, it's not like that here. There's so many writers wanting to break into business. There's so many people that it's sort of like you get your shot. And if you don't knock it out of the park, you might not get another shot. In fact, here's something that's pretty chilling, um, and I'm not going to quote the name because I don't have permission, but um, not that long ago I was talking to an agent at a, at a, a, a one of the bigger agencies, and they said something that this is, I think it's really important for, for uh, list, listeners to hear this. Um, he said, it's 
if you, you think they said if we read a script from a new writer and we don't think that script is just pitch perfect, authentic, not going to represent that writer ever. They're blacklisted. And at first I got kind of upset because I know for a fact that if writers can engage in the right kind of training, they can dramatically improve. And so, okay, so this writer maybe isn't where they need to be today, but three years from now or two years from now or four years from now, they might be an amazing writer. And so I just got upset. You know, the teacher in me got really upset, and I started to push back. And he knew exactly where I was going, and he shut me down. He said, no, no, you don't get it. He goes, we made a strategic decision to not be in the stupid writer business. And that's when I was like, whoa, okay, now I don't know what you're talking talking about. He he goes, it's really simple. He just points, you know, if you get hired by Wolfgang Peterson to write a script, you have a deadline. Like, at some point, you've got to turn that script in no matter what, and you've got to make it as good as you can, but you've got a deadline. He goes, if you're trying to break in the business, there's no deadline. So if you're trying to break in the business and you have moved mountains to get me to read your script or someone else in my agency, if that script is not pitch perfect authentic, you're an idiot. And we don't want to represent stupid writers because even if their writing improves, they're still stupid. And stupid writers, they just take more time and energy. They create more messes. It's just, we don't want to be in a stupid writer business. And I would respectfully disagree with this person because I work with writers and I know that a lot of writers go out with scripts when they shouldn't. And it's not because they're stupid. It's just because they're insecure. It's because they're impatient. It's because they're delusional. It's just they're listening to their own people. Because I know what it's like if your writing group or your teacher is telling the straight. Or even worse, people spend money, they go online, and they hire someone to do coverage of the script and, you know, a script consultant. And, um, and if people have really good, impressive credit. Well, the thing is, is if you're online marketing yourself as a reader or a script consultant, you're, that's probably a big part of your business. And so you want repeat customers. And happy customers are repeat customers. So a lot of these folks have a reputation for skewing everything positive. I'm not saying that's true of all of them, but a lot of them. And so, you know, someone will go online, find someone who used to work at DreamWorks and Warner Brothers and pay this person X amount of money, and this person says, oh, your script's brilliant. You should go out to the marketplace with it. I can understand how that writer would feel confident in that. It doesn't mean they're stupid. It means they're a little, uh, maybe a little naive, but they're not stupid. So, mm-hmm. but the point is, people get blacklisted. Yet your first impression means so much. And every agent or manager that I bring into my UCLA classes or my private workshops, they always say, single biggest mistake that writers make, new writers, is going out to the marketplace before they're ready. Right. So can we, uh, I want to change gears for just a second and talk about sure. actual, um, the actual writing process and, and some of the ways that people can improve. Mm-hmm. Now, when you talk about not using these paradigms and things like, you know, the, the structures that are kind of pre-built and it's kind of like writing by numbers or whatever, right. um, you know, for a lot of people and a lot of the screenwriters that I've talked to, um, that are not at the same level you are, but they're writing independent films. Um, they kind of rely on that stuff to, you know, when they go into the abyss and they're trying to put to the, together their story, they use that sometimes to kind of put things together and figure out, you know, how everything's going to look. What What is your advice for, you know, let's say, for example, before you're ever writing and sitting down and, and you know, writing the actual screenplay, what is your process for building that blueprint and that structure of your story before you begin? So that's a great question. I'm going to have to respectfully say like that would be an entire podcast in itself. Um, is what <laughs> okay. we're talking. But, but here's what I'll say. So, you know, I got hired to write Metropolis for Richard Scott, as I talked about, and I'm in London, like it's the second night we're having dinner and um, the producer leans over and says, Hey, I know you, you go to East LA film school. And I said, yes, I do. Because you've learned that 3X structure of this and a point, you know, all that stuff. And I'm like, yes, I have. Because if you try to write Metropolis to that, yes, 
use a different word, I will fire you so fast your head will spin, and I'll bring in a real lighter. And I, I thought he was joking. I started laughing, and then he said, I am not joking. And I was so <laughs> fortunate. So fortunate. They took me under their wing, and they taught me story design and organic story structure. Because, uh, and, and actually, let me finish the story, and then I'll backtrack. And so, you know, when it was on the front page of Variety that really Scott was making it, I got it by all these big parties around town. I was the guy for like seven minutes. And I was at a party actually at my agent's house and, you know, Cali Corey's there and Milo Foreman and, and all these writers who like had careers I could only dream of. And it was shocking. They all just make fun of the writers who follow these paradigms. And so one of the things I do in my UCLA class, um, because a lot of my students have, have that paradigm hammered into them, is I'll bring in an agent from an agency, and I'll ask them to bring in, of all the writers they signed in the last year, to bring in the script that they signed those writers off of. Because, okay, if it's Cali, um, Cali Corey, Selma, and Louise, if it's Salvo Cody, it's Juno, you know, you know, you can, your listeners can get access to those scripts. But a lot of the time, you know, if it's Eric Singer and it's this guy that's falling, that script didn't get made. And there's a good chance it's not sitting there on the internet. So a lot of writers, when they get signed, you know, I worked with a writer just recently, coached a writer, who wrote a TV pilot. It didn't sell, but it got her all these meetings, and she's got a $400,000 overall deal at one of the studios. But you're not going to find that script online. So the agents will bring in the scripts that they sign people off of. And then I just have everybody go through the scripts, and you can take any of the paradigms that you want and just how many of those scripts follow the paradigm? And the answer is usually none or, you know, one or two, but very rarely. Um, that's where I would start my classes because it isn't about, well, Corey says this thing and this teacher says that thing and this teacher says that thing. No, it's just about what the reality is in the marketplace. I think a big reason that people follow the paradigm is, um, A, it's easier. Uh, to really understand organic story structure and story design, it takes a, it takes training and skill set. That's a whole nother, like a lot of people, they, what they want to do is plot. People don't understand the difference between plotting and the story. So a plot is this happens and then this happens and then this happens and then this happens. And you're trying to make those things interesting or funny or, or scary or, or thrilling, you know, whatever kind of script you're trying to write. And you're very focused on this happens and this happens and this happens. Ooh, and then this happens and then, wow, this happens. That's the plot. Story is the whole different. So that makes it interesting. A story makes it meaningful and impactful and memorable. A whole different way of thinking about it. And it's the integration of story and plot. And there's just a lot of training and skill set that go into it. It can be taught. It can be learned. This is the kind of work that the top managers do with their writers. This is, and here's the quick little commercial plug, it's what I do in the workshop. And so a lot of people don't have that training. So then their only options is follow paradigm or just follow their instincts, just sort of follow their impulses and instincts or follow the character around. But here's the thing, if you follow your characters around, they'll do a lot of interesting things. It's just not going to turn into a really compelling story generally. Um, and if you follow your instincts and impulses, um, you can write a really interesting first draft, but there aren't many people in the world whose instincts and impulses consistently drive to a successful story. There's a lot that goes into pitch perfect authentic. So, you know, I think for a lot of people, their choices are follow a paradigm, well, kind of make this stuff up and follow my instincts. And that second option um, generally does not, you know, lead to success. Um, so that's why they, they follow the paradigm. I think people follow the paradigm because it's been lied to. You know, they've been told this is what readers look for. Uh, you won't be considered by an agent if you don't do this. And it's the opposite. Um, in my current class, I've got like four different readers. And they each one, and I didn't say anything, they each one on their own said, you know, to the class, we've been told to throw away any of the scripts of all these paradigms because nobody's interested in those kinds of scripts or writers, especially on a TV product. So, um, 
it takes, it, you know, I do an entire eight week workshop in story design. So it's just not feasible for me to answer that question in the, the short space. But, um, for the listeners, you know, what I would say is, hey, don't take my word for it. You don't know me. Uh, I'm a pretty nice guy, but maybe you don't know me. Um, and, but don't take your other, don't take any other guest on this podcast word for it. That's my opinion. Don't take your teacher's word for it. Don't take some famous guru. Don't, don't take anyone word for it. It's too important. Get your hands on scripts that have launched careers. That's not that hard to do if you network around. You can reach out to writers and say, would it be possible to see the script that launched your career? It's not that hard to get, or if you know agents or managers or you know someone that works for an agent or manager, it's just not that hard in the electronic PDF world to get your hands on the script. Um, but that's going to be, that's, how far is that going to be from the ones that are like the published ones that you see at like... No, that's, yeah, know. it's different. We're often, it's just, just the, we're looking for the script that launched somebody's career. We're looking for okay. the script that you're an unknown writer, you wrote a script, and a manager, you know, read the script and said, I'm going to work with you. Or that's a script that WME or CAA, you know, uh, signed you off of. Or, like, so, so, for instance, in my case, you could find Metropolis online. Um, but the script that launched my career, you cannot find online. So the script that got me into a room for really Scott to hire me and write Metropolis, you can't. That script, you're not going to find online. But, you know, Metropolis is a script that you could find online. But you really want to go back to script. Anyway, my point is you look at those scripts and then take any of the paradigms that you want and ask yourself. Now, it's different with, like, if you start looking at lower budget genre films, yeah, you know, you are going to see a lot of uh, paradigms. It's a, it's a different game. It's a different arena. Although that said, um, you know, if somebody wants to write a thriller script, like you, I, I suggest trying to write an elevated thriller script that isn't just, you know, paint by the numbers. You know, for instance, Plants of the Land. Now, it doesn't really count because it's adapted from a novel, but let's just say it wasn't adapted from a novel. Like, that's a really thrilling script, but it has elevated characters, elevated stories. So you write a script like that, you have a shot in the majors. You have a shot to launch a career. And if it doesn't happen, you know, you can always go down and, well, I, I guess science will have is kind of a, um, it, it's probably too expensive to make on a, on a, you know, budget. But, you know, uh, a script like uh, Ex Machina, um, you know, very contained, one location, what, two, three characters, um, that, that's the kind of script. It's an elevated script, you know. Alex Scarlett, mm-hmm. like, that's a great script. Um, and it's not a paint by the number script. It's just what you're looking for is, first of all, we're looking for characters that are authentic and compelling. And whenever you have characters that have to do certain things on certain pages, certain events have to happen, um, then they're not going to feel authentic. Secondly, you know, I used to be a studio reader. And it's like, you read a script and it's like, Okay, here comes the big surprise of this. It's so not surprising. Okay, here comes the big, you know, insight and insight. You just see it coming a mile away. And when you read, you know, writers are only working on one script. They don't understand the pile of the scripts that are moving through readers' lives. And so when you've just read 50 scripts that are structured pretty much the same way, they all just get forgettable. They all feel generic. And then along comes... So I, I was on a screenwriting panel a little while ago, and the person was, some writer's like, I'm writing on a noir script. And this expert said, stop, stop right now. It's the stupidest thing. No one's going to buy a noir script. No agent's going to buy a how. <laughs> but here's the thing. That, that person luckily didn't listen to that person. They wrote that script, and they just got signed by a team of agents at CA. I have no idea if that noir script is going to sell. Probably not. But it got CA. They're not rep by CAA. And they're taking lots of meetings. Because here's the thing. I'm a reader, and I'm going through a pile of scripts. And suddenly, there's this noir script. Doesn't have the inciting incident on page 10. Doesn't have that. Not only the abyss on a certain page, but this kind of abyss, or the false false low beat on the mid, whatever. It doesn't. It's not constructed that way. It's not different for the sake of being different. It's different because it's an authentic story. 
that's unfolding at its own pace. And it has a reason for the way it's structured. And I just never seen a script like this. It's like uh, the next week I'm driving home, I'm thinking about that script. I ain't thinking about everything else. So when my boss or my friend who works at another production company says, you read anything good lately? That's the script I'm going to talk about. That's the script that I remember. And that's the script that people start talking about. That's the script that can launch a career. So now that said, I have a lot of clients who write those kind of scripts. They don't sell. They take meetings. Nothing happens. They're at another script like that. Doesn't sell. They take meetings. Maybe then the agent says, okay, we really kind of took a shot at really launching you big. You know, maybe this next script, we do want to bend it a little bit more towards convention. So take your unique voice. Let's not write a four square straight down the middle, save the cat script. Let's not do that because that will just be ignored. But let's take your sensibility and your abilities and let's see if we can't bend it a little bit towards something a little bit more conventional and see what happens. But that's, that's the plan B. It's not the plan A. Right? Plan A is write something that blows people away that nobody's seen before, that people go, oh, my God, even if I can't buy this script, I want to meet this writer. I want to work with this writer. I love this writing. I would love to work with this writer. That's your job. Get a bunch of relationships. Get a bunch of people excited about you. Maybe that turns into a job. Maybe it doesn't. Um, but if it doesn't, you have all these fans who want to work with you. You write another script, a whole other shot at something happening. Somewhere down the road, yeah. And I, I've seen this with some of my uh, clients or students. Then they'll have that conversation with their agent or manager, and maybe then they will say, all right, why don't we write to this target that's a little bit more of a commercial target? Um, so we can at least get you some money, and we can at least start to get you a track record. But while you're doing that, keep writing your original stuff on the side, because when one of those things break, that's how you become an aimless writer. You know, so you think about Aaron Sorkin. You think about Alan Ball. You think about David Sutherland. Like, like, the script that makes them, or Eric Singer, you know, and you look at a script like American Hustle. It's not following the paradigm. It's not a conventionally structured script. It's a uniquely structured script with unique characters. And now he's an A.M.S. writer. Um, you know, the guys who wrote The Nick, they, they had a really nice career. They're doing comedy. You know, they're out competing for jobs or landing jobs, making good money. They write the script, the Nick. It's perfect, authentic. You know, it's not following the paradigm. It's not following the formula. It's original. It's unique. It's, and now, after the first year of the Nick, you know, studio heads are taking them out to dinner. Um, stars are taking them out. Directors are taking them out. Basically, instead of them chasing jobs, better jobs are chasing them. And that's what happens when you write one of these scripts and it hits. And you have to be lucky for it to hit. But even if it doesn't hit, it gets you in a room with the Ridley Scott to pitch stuff. So that's why you get some managers are looking for this. So um, all I know is that I, I'm getting more and more people in the industry sending me writers to work with me because people will say these writers have a... a a great sense of dialogue. Uh, they can really write action. They can really do comedy. They can really do this. They can really do that. But they don't know. They're just formulized. They, I get a lot of MFA students who've been taught that sort of traditional film school approach, which really made sense in the 80s, made a lot of sense in the 90s, kind of stopped making sense seven years ago, and now it's a kiss of death. Now, what, what's the difference with your students? Can you tell the ones who are going to have success and the ones who are going to probably drop off? Um, no, and I've really tried to stay blind to that. Um, I really think it's important that when I work with everybody, they get the exact same focus and the exact same enthusiasm. And the other thing, though, is I have worked with people who I privately thought were some of the worst writers I ever, like, just... Like, privately, it was like, uh, I just don't see. The, the, their mountain is so high to climb. <laughs> like, their weaknesses and blind spots are so abundant. Uh, and I've seen them become amazing writers and 
and go on, and I'm not going to name names, obviously, but have really good careers. Certainly, it's not true of all of them, but it's happened enough that it's got me to realize my assessment doesn't it, – it doesn't matter where you start. It matters where you end, and it matters how – committed you are, how growth mindset you are, how willing you are to put in the work, but, but put in the right amount of work or the kind of work because that's where dedicated practice comes in. So a lot of people buy into this idea that if you want to be really good, just keep writing. The more you write, the better you'll get. It's not true. Uh, for most people, the more they write, they certainly start learning from mistakes. They certainly do get somewhat better, but there's core weaknesses and blind spots they don't know. There's there's just consistent mistakes they make. And so the more they write, they just end up with a larger pile of similarly flawed scripts. They hit a ceiling they can't get past. A lot of my students come from that space. And so what they get excited about is are there actual exercises that can teach skills, that can teach tools, that can make them actually significantly get better. Um, I'll see if you want, because we've been talking sort of abstractly, um, and I have to go in a little bit. I know it's been a while, but I'll give, um, if, if we have time, I can give one example of one of these skill sets. So at least this isn't all left in the abstract. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, that would be good. Okay. So one of the skill sets is what I would call creative integration, and it basically goes down like this. Most writers, when you write, you can work from a conceptual place or an intuitive place. And these are very different muscles and very different approaches. And most writers are wired to work one way or the other. So conceptual writers and intuitive writers, let's say. So conceptual writers tend to write outside in, and intuitive writers tend to work inside out. Conceptual writers tend to, uh, when they're working... They're very focused on what other people will be thinking. They're very focused on plotting. They're very focused on logic, making sure things make sense, things are properly set up, pacing, having interesting things happening. Um, Intuitive writers have a very different navigation. They are working from an authentic place. They're working from a place of what's interesting to them, what's true to the character, what would the character really do. It's a very different space. A conceptual writer tends to be somebody who would say, I've got to figure out my story before I write it, where an intuitive writer would say, I need to write my story so that I can figure it out. Very different. And so their scripts get, there's a different experience reading the script. So, for instance, let's talk about characters. Conceptual writers invent their characters. They design their characters. And so the characters never feel real. They feel invented. They, on some level, feel a little bit like puppets who've been created at least in time to serve the plot. And these writers often have great ideas, big concepts, good plotting, but where they're falling short in the marketplace is their characters aren't strong enough. Intuitive writers, it's a very different experience. Intuitive writers don't invent the characters. They don't design the characters. They discover the characters. And the characters are like real people to them and real people to us. And they they speak like real characters or real people. And you can feel that they are like real characters. But the intuitive mind is so focused on what is authentic what the characters really do, these writers can't construct strong stories. So they have great characters, always in search of a strong story, where conceptual writers have all the story worked out, but they don't have strong characters. And it gets worse than that. With conceptual, most conceptual writers, when you read their work, there's all of this interesting thing happening. All these interesting events are happening. It's just not interesting because you don't feel anything when you read it because they didn't feel anything when they wrote it. It's a different space that they're working in. And so you've got these writers who can get half of the equation but not the other half. And here's the problem. 
everybody always writes in a way to try to get the best possible script. You know, if you've been hired by someone in a studio or a network, you obviously want to write the best possible script, and that's obvious. If you have an agent or a manager, you want them to love your script and champion it and take it out and change your life with it. If you don't have an agent or a manager, you want to write a really great script so you can get an agent or a manager. Or if you're really kind of new in the game and you're like, I'm not ready for an agent or a manager, you're probably trying to write the best possible script so that you can feel that you're not wasting your time and that people you show your script to, yeah, maybe you know there's going to be issues with it, but, but at least the kind of feedback you get leads you to believe you might have a shot. And this isn't just a stupid dream that you're chasing. So we're going to always try to write the best scripts that we can write. And so what we do knowingly or unknowingly is we play to our strengths and we hide our weaknesses, which is what we should do. You know, if I'm trying to write my best possible script, I should play to my strengths and hide my weaknesses. Well, over time, my strengths get stronger and stronger and my weaknesses get weaker and weaker. And it's a big reason why writers can't get there. They can't get to that level they need to get to. So one of the skill sets I teach in my workshops is you're going to write to your weakness and hide your strength. So if you're a conceptual writer, you're going to work from a very intuitive place until you can develop and strengthen that intuitive side. Until your intuitive side is as strong as your conceptual side. Vice versa, if you're an intuitive writer, you're going to work on your conceptual side. And so the first step is identifying your weak side and developing that, focusing on that, until it becomes as strong as your strong side. And then the second step is the actual creative integration, which is learning how to integrate these two sides so that you can now write great characters and great story. Because pitch perfect authentic. Authentic means you have to be a rock star on the intuitive skill set as an intuitive writer. And pitch perfect means you have to be a rock star on the conceptual side. And most people are not integrated, and their writing practice leads to disintegration. So, you know, you talk to conceptual writers and you ask, what are you working on? It's always conceptual writers hang out in the same space. You know, they do horror films, high-concept horror films. They do thrillers, sci-fi, big idea comedies, action, big plot-driven, concept-driven material because they can kind of hide the fact that they're not that great at characters and dialogue. Two of the writers are writing small, quirky character, emotional type material where it's all about the characters and the dialogue uh, and the emotion, kind of hiding the fact that they're not really that good at story structure. Well, the thing is there's a lot of people out there who can write really good emotion character stuff that can't do story structure, and nobody really cares for the most part about those writers. We're looking for writers that can do both. Um, one of my students is directing a film that's coming out in two weeks, uh, or has directed a film for Paramount uh, Comedy. It's testing. Uh, it's called Drunk Wedding. It's testing really hot. And so there's a buzz about this guy. And, you know, he was complaining to me because he's reading all these scripts looking for his next project, and there's all these scripts he says, so really funny, great jokes, great structure, great idea, but these characters, they just feel like stock characters, and there's no heart to it. And I'm just not going to hook my career wagon up to one of these scripts. Because, and then I read scripts that, like, they're great characters, and there's a sense of, like, heart to it. But it's just there's no story, there's no stakes, the structure is all over the place. It's, it's so hard to find someone that can do both. And then his complaint here all the time is I finally find one of those scripts. And, of course, it's spoken for, you know. And, and you know, it's been bought by some major player, you know. So the, the big players, they're buying up all those scripts. Because either they want to make it or they want to keep their, their up-and-coming competition from being able to make those scripts. So... You know, if someone's listening to this and they are so great with character and emotion uh, and dialogue, if they can get better at structure and actually tell interesting stories like American Beauty, you know, have both, they're a rarefied company and they will be sought after. Vice versa, if you have someone listening to this and they're really good at, and they love horror film, they love high concept horror film or thrillers, uh, low budget or studio level, um, comedy action, what have you, 
you can get better at the character front and the and, and have some genuine emotion in there, um, man, you stand out. You stand out. Because there's just so few people that can do both. So that's an example of one of the things that we work on in the workshop, and it's called creative integration. You know, for those of you listening, um, if you're interested in this, go to my website. It's coreymandel.net. Um, you know, I teach something called professional screenwriting workshop, which is the, the foundational workshop, um, and it teaches conceptual and intuitive skill sets. It's eight weeks, and um, sorry if you're interested in a commercial, but I'll I'll be quick with it. Um, we do it. <laughs> we do it in uh, LA and Santa Monica, and if you don't live in LA. Or if you do live in LA, we do it online using WebEx. So if you take another online class, so this is like real time. So it's like going to a brick and mortar class. And you can see and hear everybody. You just get to be uh, at your computer. And and we've had writers take it from all over the world. Um, the uh, the June ones are sold out. We tend to be about six months out. So we'll be doing them in September. And those are starting to sell out, but there's still spaces. Um if you really want to do the June one, you can email my assistant, uh, and she can put me on the wait list, and sometimes the spot does open. Um, so my website is coreymandel.net, and my assistant is Lisa, so she's lisa at coreymandel.net. Or if you want to email me, uh, corey at coreymandel.net, and those emails are uh, on the website, which is coreymandel.net. The other thing I suggest you know, is, Sign up for the newsletter. We will often we do like once a month. We'll so interview an agent, we'll interview a manager, we'll interview a writer who sold the script. So um, that might be of interest. But um, and I know that we've been talking a long time. I think you know. Let's see what the response is from your listeners. Um, maybe people just think I'm a big blowhard. But if people are interested, <laughs> if people are interested in the stuff that you want, I'm happy to come back and talk about more of the skill sets. I, I think we talked a lot about sort of the marketplace and what agents and managers are thinking and looking for. And, and we talk a lot about mistakes people make and, and what you have to accomplish, but we haven't really, and I know this is what your later questions were, but this whole sort of subject of, okay, how do you actually do it? What are these skills? Right. Um, I could certainly talk more about that if you want to, you know, if there is interest from your listeners and you want to have me back, I'd be happy to do it. Yeah, man, that would definitely be great. I mean, there's even the stuff that you were just talking about that I, w- I would love to go further into detail with. But, yeah, we would need more time. So, yeah. but yeah, I, I really appreciate it. And we, you know, let's definitely do like a part two sometime where we get more into actual screenwriting and structuring and all the, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of it all. Love to do it. All right, man. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot for coming on the show. And, uh, you know. Great. Do you know when this will be set up? Yeah, uh, it will probably be next week or the week I, I try to schedule uh, screenwriting between, you know, we do producing, funding, distribution. So I try to do like all four. Um, you know, I don't, I try not to repeat screenwriting twice. So I don't think I've had a screenwriting one in like, like four episodes. So probably pretty soon, Great. maybe next shoot me, week. Shoot me an email when it does with the link and I'll, I'll help get the word out. All right, man. Well, I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Fun. All right. Yeah, All right, I want to thank my guest, Corey Mandel, for coming on the show, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Academy podcast. Don't forget to join our newsletter for more tips and tricks on how to make and market your film online. Go to www.indiefilmacademy.com. Oh, that feels warm. I like your sweater. Is that coming to V-neck? If she starts doing his pubes, I'm out of here. I'm gonna look good after this, man. Thanks, man. So, ready? Yeah. Itch. Ni. Thumb. Oh, you! Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's just your job. Huh? No, 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 no. That's okay. Uh, let's, Let's do another. That one little patch looks sexy, though. Does it look good? Yeah, it looks really good. Ooh. It looks mantastic. Ooh. Okay. Whew. Wow. I didn't expect that at all. I really didn't expect that. You got it. Wow. The first one's the only one that hurts. Yeah. Well, those hairs are pretty deep. Okay. You ready? Yep. Itch. Me. Suck. Suck. You shit out. Oh, I hate you. 
I hate you so much. You. That one hurt. That one hurt just as much as the first one. That's great, man. Man. One, two, three. Ah! Fuck me! Oh, 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 oh. Wow, we. That. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I really don't swear this much. Okay, you know what? You know, I got a weak stomach. That's all I can really take. All right, I'll see y'all. Jay, 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 be tough, Andy. You got it. Where did Jay go? He went to throw up. <laughs> Ready? Yep. One, two. Oh, oh. Cocksucker, mother! You pulled on two. You pulled on two. Why didn't you pull on three? Three pie hole. Come on, see y'all. No, Kelly Clarkson. Three. Are y'all done? Are y'all? Yeah. What's next? No, you're doing the nipple. Oh, not the nipple. Come not on. The nipple. Not the That's nipple. Not please. the nipple. Please, Cal, hold my hand. Oh. Do it. Just hold. Okay, here we go. Whoo. 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 No. Yep. Yep. One, two, three. No. Ah! Oh, Mika, you should burn in hell. Okay. All right. No, seriously. I think I'm done. Whoo. I think we're done. I think that's good.